We are back. Welcome to the Leadership Launchpad Project. I'm Rob Kalvarowski, and we have a special co-host today, former Wisconsin Badger and first overall draft pick, Lauren Williams. Lauren, how are you? Man, I've missed that intro. I haven't had that one in a while. It's good to be back with you, Rob. I missed this. It's always good, and... For folks out there, so Lauren also has done one of these podcasts with us before. So if you've missed that one, go back into the archives. And we actually hosted a podcast for together for almost a year called Dismantling the High Performance Narrative, a lot about mental health. So wherever you're finding this one, you can hit the archives for that one. Uh, we don't have time to do it all now. So we've sort of parked <laughs> that one. And... As always, we love to start this podcast with a quote. And so I want to start one here. And, and because our guest pointed, I, I don't want to say his name yet, <laughs> pointed out the picture behind me. I'll start one from Lao Tzu. And he says, the key to growth is the introduction of higher dimensions of consciousness into our awareness. Mm-hmm. So we always start there, and that's the journey. And we, Lauren, obviously, you know, as we teach in the Leadership Launchpad program, that we always start with self-awareness. And we start with leaders not only becoming emotionally aware of themselves, but also how are they showing up for their folks. So that's just something to get going. Now we have an absolutely returning special guest, the author of the number one selling top of the leaderboard, still, still top of the leaderboard, the author of Disruption Leadership Matters, Gary Ryan's back with us. Gary, how are you? I'm very good, Rob and Lauren. Great to meet you and see you as well. Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And so Gary... Obviously, before we get into it, so we have to just then all everyone obviously should go back into the archives and check out the first one. But can you just give us a quick overview of yourself and then also let us know how long has it been number one for your book? Uh, well, it's, it's uh, got to number one in January 30, and um, it's actually gone back to number one in the, the main category eight times now, including just last week. So um, it seems to uh, bounce bounce along there and, uh, you know, doing quite well in uh, those categories. There's, the second category has been number one five times, and the third category, folks, we've, we've just got to number two eight times so far. So <laughs> We need a few more purchases and we'll get it there. <laughs> yeah. And to be honest, you know, it's not, I mean, the purchases are great and I really appreciate it, but um, it's really about the reach and the impact. It's a bit like your podcast. I mean, that's that's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to to engage in conversations and, and, and you know, like uh, your quote, um, really start getting people to, to, to think for themselves and, and reach out and ask some questions. And, and I'm sure we'll go there today is ask for help because there's plenty of help out there for folk that actually want to go down this path of, of uh, lead, leading in the 21st century. So a little bit about myself, uh, just briefly. Uh, again, there's a bit more of a full version back in the uh, episode we did earlier this year. Uh, but Gary Ryan, I've run my business called Organisations That Matter for uh, 15 years now. Uh, we had our birthday back in February of this year for 15 years. And I fundamentally work with organisations that understand they have human beings in them and that human beings matter. And that's why the company's called Organisations That Matter, because I work with folk that actually understand they've got human beings, not human resources. <laughs> All right. Okay. I like um, human capital too. That's another good one yeah, I like. <laughs> human capital, human assets. I mean, we, we these, these are actually relatively recent um, um, labels that have been used, to be quite honest. Human resources is a bit older, but the capital and assets is certainly a bit more recent over the past couple of decades, first sort of came out in the late uh, 1990s. And it, it's really gotten away from really the intent and the and, and Bob Chapman in his book, uh, Everyone Matters. I, f- I assume you might be familiar with Bob Chapman from Barry Waymiller Group. Yep. Um, you know, what, what's great about the Barry Waymiller Group is they're actually an example of a, of a you know, $3 billion organisation with 12,000 staff over multiple countries. They're actually doing everything we're advocating. It actually exists. And so for a lot of folk out there that go, you know, unless it exists, it's not real. Well, 
it exists, it's real, and but they don't do a single thing for their people because it's going to make more money for the company. The reality is it does, but that's not why they do it, you know, and it's that high level of consciousness with that quote that you said is they do it because it's the right thing to do. And, and that might sound corny to folk out there, but I guess that's what my business is about is uh, working with folk that it's about actually treating human beings as human beings, as whole human beings. Um, and as a result of that, we, we help them and support them on their journey uh, to be the best human being that they can. And sometimes that will mean that they might need to move to another organization because we're of our size that there might not be opportunities further for them. And we would actually help facilitate that. And, you know, I'm delighted that numerous ones of my clients have been able to get to that level of consciousness and, and, and do those sorts of things. Whereas organisations also equally could be really large and they actually can facilitate people moving into places that are the right, uh, right for them and enabling people to go on journeys that ultimately, and I guess this is the key point uh, about why we exist, is having folks go home to whatever home is for them and being a whole human, per, human being um, and not having had things happen at work that negatively impact them at home that then often actually contributes quite significantly to homes breaking down. And that's not great for society. So, you know, I'm a big believer that there's a direct link between leadership in the workplace and actually what's going on in society. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a connection. Um, and, and the leaders that we work with, and I mentioned Michelle Hunt, um, who's uh, a wonderful African-American uh, who I've learned a great deal from and, and how she quotes Max Dupree when she was working at Herman Miller, an office furniture company, and Herman said that leadership is a serious meddling in other people's lives. And, and that's the bit that they were talking about. <laughs> uh, it, can, it can meddle. And, and you know, I, I love working with folk that get that and don't want to meddle uh, you know, and want to help people be the best that they can be. Uh, understanding well, each of us are very on complex creatures, all right? Um, there's a lot to us. <laughs> <laughs> but that's fundamentally what we're about. The book, um, did you want me to just briefly talk sure, about where the book go for it. Yeah, the start of the pandemic, which seems like forever ago now, um, early 2020, uh, had some a couple of issues happen really close to home. I had a lot of work, possibly like yourselves, just gets paused and stopped. Uh, and then all of a sudden I had the gift of time. But some, some bad things had happened to some folks that were close to us. It indicated that they were just headcount, right? You know, you're a resource, you're a number, headcount, let's reduce it, and and or just uh, very, very poor leadership where they were seriously meddling in people's lives who were already stressing about what was going on in the world and then the, the behaviour of the leaders increased that stress rather than decrease it. Um, and I went, okay, there's, there's a book to be written here. I wonder whether this pandemic is going to cause the disruption and for me, disruption means step change. Is this the opportunity for the step change for people to actually lead differently moving forward? And I would argue lead in a 21st century way rather than a 20th century way, uh, which is where human resources came from uh, with Henry Ford and Frederick Winslow Taylor and Taylorism and scientific management from 1908. Um, you know, that's where it came from and people don't know, uh, right? Um and uh, move into the 21st century. So that's, I, and I decided I could write a book about all the negative stuff or a couple of, you know, examples of that. But then how about I go and find the folk that are actually leading human beings and share their stories? So that's what Disruption Leadership Matters Lessons for Leaders from the Pandemic is all about. And I love it, right? And and you're, you're so right is there's so many examples of the negative and some folks don't believe that it's, possible or real or scalable or whatever other words they're going to use but it truly is and it truly will impact your business and even you know like adam grant the other day had his research and they were saying you know giving people meaning adds like 40 like 142 percent to their productivity which leads to 170 percent profitability increase and it's like it's that expression that i heard from kim scott which is like there is this enlightened self-interest which mm. i i love that i really love that now which is like you can do the right thing 
And also, it's good for your business. Mm. And it'll just be good by just doing the right thing for people. Right. It, it, like those percentages, the 142% um, increase in productivity, that will all happen. But interestingly, I guess Bob Chapman's work really highlights this. That actually can't be the reason why you do it because then it's not really genuine. Yeah. Right? And this is, the, this is the really tricky level of consciousness, I guess, that people have to get is you, you will get those outcomes pretty much guaranteed. We've got enough research to prove it, but that actually can't be the reason. The reason's got to be it's the right thing to do. And that's this is, the leap. That's yeah. the leap that people struggle with. Right. And this is like Lauren, right? Like we teach yes. a course on and we talk about body language and, and mindset and alignment and all that stuff. Like, do you want to talk a little bit about that part? Like, how come we can't fake it? Hmm. Well, I mean, there's thousands of years of programming behind all of that. That means that you can't fake it. Right? Mm. People are great at reading other people because we've had to be, right? When we're hunter-gatherers, we're trying to figure out what groups are friends versus what groups are foes. These are basic skills that we have had for thousands of years. So if you know anyone who's good enough at faking authenticity, let me know because I would love to meet them. But <laughs> that's it's, it is true, right? And, and we talk about it in the sense of you have to figure out why it's important for you to be doing this. And that's where the authenticity comes from. And if you're so focused on the outcome that you want to achieve, you skip over all those minute little details that create the authenticity. So when we talk about those minute details, it's you know showing genuine care for somebody, paying attention en enough to pick up on the subtleties of what they're saying, that demonstrate that you're actively listening, you know, being able to, through Zoom especially, convey that, hey, I am listening to you. I'm not toggling through five different screens, you know, essentially showing you that I don't care what you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why body language is so important. And the majority of the way that we listen and pay attention to people and what they're saying and what they're communicating is nonverbal. Verbal is only what? What is it, Rob? I'm blanking on the stat right now. It's like seven percent or something like that. Yeah, I think like it's what we actually that. say is only seven percent of what we are looking for when we're communicating with other people. The rest of it is body language, tonality, the volume that we're speaking at, the pace at which we're speaking. All of these other things is what creates the perception that we have of what someone is communicating to us and ultimately what we take away from that conversation. So again, if you can find somebody for me that's going to pull the wool over my eyes on all of those things, send them my way because I'd, I'd love to be hoodwinked. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, you know, the, the test to prove about the body language and how important it is, is if you've ever traveled, and many people have now, if you've ever traveled to another country where, in our case, English isn't the first language and the other person can't speak English and you can't speak their language, it's amazing how you find a way to communicate where you want to go and what your problem is and how they, you know, you might do this movement towards your mouth because you're hungry and they'll point you towards food. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we've we, we, we've got we've got that really example, and um, you know I'm working with one of the my clients at the moment who's a business owner, and his leg is always going. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, and I've got permission that I can you know he's given me permission to gently place my hand on his knee if I'm sitting next to him now that we're able to do a bit more uh, on site work, just you know to remind him stop your knee because his whole body shakes when it happens and. The message is hurry up. Yes. Hurry up. Yeah. You know, I've got something else I want to talk about or I've got something else I want to do or I want to be somewhere else. It says you're not present. Mm -hmm. Completely. Yeah, he doesn't and he doesn't want to convey that, but he's so used to being like that because he's done a thousand things at once and got a reasonable degree of success, but at, he's got to this point where the organisation needs more leaders and needs him to lead for that to happen. So he has to actually slow down. <laughs> Often you need to slow down to speed up. <laughs> 
Slower is faster. So, Gary, we, I wanted to talk about that, right? And this is what we were, we sort of started off with this, starting to expand our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I have another quote here from Carl Jung, and he says, there is no coming to consciousness without pain. Mm -hmm. And this is where we wanted to start was like, how do we start opening up those 1.0 liters to a different way? The big, the big starting up is ultimately each of us have to come to the, the water to drink it. Each of us has to decide that I want to be different. I want to transform myself or whatever language is appropriate. Now we can have support and guidance and help. And it could be as simple as um, one of your listeners who's already a 2.0 leader or 4.0, as we saw on LinkedIn <laughs> recently, Bob, um, who already, you know, in quote, gets it. Just encouraging someone to listen to an episode like this or to, you know, uh, listen to an audio book or sit in on a speech. And and that's how help and support can be um, really, really important to, to getting people to start having the conversation. And they might even start with, oh, that's not possible. That's all, you know, label, label, negative label, all this sort of stuff. But ultimately they need to... Um, decide for themselves and and for a lot of folk they might not realize and, and it might be something in their life that happens that pain that you mentioned from Carl Jung uh that can happen I mean I, I know in my own case um for for some reason the the 12 year old that I, I remember as a 12 year old in my head I was going to be great I remember I believe this because uh Gary means courage and great in um the Celtic background of my name and as a kid, I'd look that up and I and I just believed I was going to be great, but not I didn't believe great from a wealth point of view or or you know being like the prime minister point of view here in Australia, sort of thing. I just it meant more than that to me. Um, and I, I probably can't articulate now, now that I'm much older than 12, exactly what that looks <laughs> like. But something hey, you are great. Come on, best selling <laughs> author, leader, yeah. two point yeah. or four point oh leader. Come on, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, and I, well, I mostly hope that I'm great with my wife, Michelle, and five children. That's that's the most important place for me to be great. And, you know, we, I consciously try to be, I can assure you. Uh, and with my broader family, you know, by the way, you know, I, I want to acknowledge my 10 brothers and sisters who mostly don't understand what I do because of the um, mostly blue-collar background of our family. And um, But when I reached out to them to let them know about how the book was going and, and would they mind letting their networks know, they got to action and, you know, we went from number seven to number one on January 30 because of <laughs> actually the of my family. And I really want to thank my brothers and sisters for that. Um, but something happened with me um, and I got and I got lost and I became a really selfish by 19 I was a really really selfish person and, and how I found that out was unfortunately I was involved in a head-on car accident uh, with my then uh, girlfriend and we'd been going out for a year and a half and um, despite uh, me getting um, some injuries at the start uh, she she got brain damage and uh, I knew she had brain damage immediately once I sort of um, we, we, we sort of stopped everything had stopped in the accident and uh, it was just an accident I made a mistake as a young driver and uh, we're in the wet and we hit the cars coming the other way and you know when I looked across she she physically looked okay but she was slumping and she had blood coming out of her right uh, right ear that I could see because uh, we drive on the opposite side to you folk um, and I had just finished a level two uh, first aid course the Tuesday before this happened on a Friday night. In fact, it was Friday the 2nd of September 1988. You don't forget dates like that. Um, and, you know, we got the ambulance came and, and really they didn't look at me at all because I, I was on my feet. Um, and um, we went to hospital. It was a crazy night at the Box Hill Hospital at the time. And, and I stayed on a gurney out in the hallway while they took her away. And then a doctor came out. And the first thing he said to me is, "What are you with the, her name? And I said, yes. And he said, well, she's going to die. That was the first thing someone said to me, right? My parents were for the first time in their lives overseas in New Zealand at the time. Um, and I went, you know, I'm just in shock. I, I, I still, I, I had some injuries which came to the surface later. Um, and he said, look, 
Um, we're going to send her off to St. Vincent's in the city because we're, we've got better doctors there. We believe we're going to maybe try some brain surgery to try and save her life, but that's what's happening. And I'm like, well, I'm coming too. And they said, no, 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 you, you have to stay here. And uh, not long after that, one of my uh, older brothers, Kelvin, he, he came to the hospital uh, and I said, you're helping me get out of here. We're escaping. Um, we're going to St. Vincent's as well. And, um, and we did. I just got off the gurney and walked out with him. By the time we got to St. Vincent's Hospital, um, her family had gathered. Her father actually lived in the Gold Coast and Queensland, so he wasn't there. Um, he had been informed uh, and uh, they were pre prepping her to go into uh, surgery for her brain. Um, and her, grand her grandfather lost his mind at me because I was driving her car. It was my mm -hmm. fault. And, um, and I just stood there and I took it because what else can you do? Um, but I was able to, um, they took her upstairs to intensive care and getting her ready for surgery. And um, I, I managed to be allowed to stay with her uh, and with her older sister. She had, she had one sister. And um, eventually her sister left and I stayed all night and they didn't actually operate. And come morning time, I was in a fair bit of pain, and one of the one of the nurses persuaded me to go down to uh, um, emergency and actually check myself in a hospital. Turned out I had a bruised spleen. Um, anyway, that night though, and this is the the crux of this story is while she was in intensive care, five times we got kicked out because they believed she was going to pass away, and I could actually read a lot of the uh, equipment. So I could see what her blood pressure was, what her heart rate was. I could actually understand that because of, uh, the, I was doing a secondary, uh, um, secondary education teaching degree and I was majoring in exercise physiology. So I'd been exposed to uh, a fair bit of that equipment. I knew what it meant. Um, and unlike the movies, you know, as I said, we've been going out for a year and a half of that time, but unlike the movies, um, I was having memories of every single time I had I had been an extremely selfish, possessive. I, I believed I owned her. That was my mind, which was completely wrong. Um, and and you know it wasn't all the great memories. Um, and and I'm sitting there, and that's when I realised I'm I've got lost. I'm not who I thought I was going to be. Now I'm not suggesting for, at all that it, that it was all of a sudden like a light switch and I became this great person um at all you know it was it was a multiple year journey um to to actually find myself but it did trigger me to start reading and the first book i read was seven habits of highly effective people by stephen covey and i read it and i read it and i reread it and then i got his books first things first which actually connected better for me but it mattered that i'd and this was over a, a, a several year period uh, throughout which time um, she had actually, um, she eventually did not get brain surgery. She spent 12 months in hospital despite the information of the brain records that she was getting the brain scans where every single lobe in her brain had been damaged, you know, and this is this is the, the amazing bit. She eventually walked out of hospital. She can talk. If you met her, you would not know that she'd gone through what she went through. Um, call it a miracle. I, I don't know what happened, but... It was a slow journey, but, you know, and I was there the first time she spoke um, after eventually my spleen actually ruptured while I was intensive. Uh, no, she was out of intensive care, but I was doing my stint with her while she was in a coma and my spleen actually ruptured. And unfortunately, the doctors at the hospital at St. Vincent's actually thought that um, I was just suffering from stomach cramps. So they sent me home with a ruptured spleen. <laughs> <laughs> So 24 hours later, I ended up being my own emergency case and blah, blah, blah. And then I had massive complications after that, et cetera. And I actually lost 20 kilos when I was in hospital. I walked out of hospital at 49 kilos, wow. um, which I don't know if you know kilos at all. Do you know kilos? About 110 pounds maybe. <laughs> so oh. anyway, that was that was the start of my, of my journey. And, I, and look, I've always said I hope, you know, I hope that people don't have to have a moment like that. I hope that people don't have to have something, but it could be that maybe they lose a job, or or, or maybe they they do have a relationship breakdown, or or maybe they get something happens, and it's it's like you know, a bit like what happened with the pandemic is I didn't realize I was doing this at the time, it's, but what's this? What's the opportunity this, is this giving me? What is this? What is this pain? What's the opportunity the pain's giving me? 
Uh, and, you know, it was years later before I actually realised that's sort of what I had done. Uh, but that's a lesson I've carried forward throughout the rest of my life, which has served me very well, to be honest. And so once you start that journey, it's amazing how the law of attraction starts to kick in, right? You know, you start meeting people. You start, you know, um, I have I had an amazing uh, general manager who, uh, you know, my first full-time job um, introduced me to Peter Senge's work uh, and, you know, in terms of the learning organisation, that's where I learned about mental models and vision and self personal mastery and all these sorts of things, and 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 realised that I can't just read this; I've got to try and do it. Mm-hmm. You know, and again, that's where again folk like yourselves and what I do is so important because we can actually help people with the doing bit, and 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 you know, I guess for folk that might see themselves maybe as a as a one point type person at the moment where it is all about me, I guess, if we define it like that. Um, And if they realise that's really ultimately, when I go home and I'm in bed, I realise that's really not working. There is help out there. There are folk that actually can walk with you and help you on that journey and not be judging you and and just supporting you and caring for you to to help you change. And, And why this is so important for me is, you know, I mentioned I've got five children and this is absolutely true, right? My eldest child's 22, the next one's 20, and my next one's 17. Today, my 14-year-old becomes eligible to get a part-time job here in Australia because he's 14 and nine months old, right? Now, the top three, all three of them have worked in fast food chain. I won't name it. (laughs) I won't name it. I actually worked there myself, and it was awesome for me, but something's changed there. All three of them who are extraordinary young uh, people in their own right, and I know I'm biased because they're my parents, but they actually are, you know, they're constantly selected as captains for their sport teams, being school captains, school vice captains, etc. You know, they 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 they, they get it and they, they're good kids. They've, they've made their own lunch since they were five for school. They, they're, you know, stuff like that. They, you know, they get they do chores and we don't have to push them too hard for that. All three of those oldest ones have been labelled as stupid and yelled at at work in their part-time jobs, all three of them already, you know, um, literally from that 14 and nine months old age by people in their 20s, young 20s. And you go, how are those people learning to lead like that? Well, that's coming from the older people. And that's sad. And that's what makes me so passionate about this work, so passionate about helping people lead because the older people are teaching younger adults how to lead in such a devastating way. Like when you've got a 15-year-old that says three weeks after working at a fast food chain, I'm just a number dad. That's, that's, That's wrong. That shouldn't happen, Right. Um, and so this work's so important. And, and for folk out there, if you're a leader that maybe is having that impact on people and you realise deep down, gosh, it's not right, but I don't know how to change, I don't know what to do, again, there is absolutely help out there. All it takes, though, is you've got to put your hand up and say, I want the help. And you know what? It can be done on the quiet. So you can reach out. I have clients right now who are actually paying for themselves because they don't want their company to know yet that they're on this journey. They're chosen to put their money in their, their hand in their own pocket to do this mm-hmm. because they want, to be, they want to be a more effective leader. And they know that it'll work out. It's a bit full on that story. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's, it's a journey, right? And it's, I totally relate to that. And for me, it was less about, you know, the leadership and all this stuff, but it was really overcoming all of the stuff that I believed about myself, right? And both of you know, like, literally spent years depressed, tried to kill myself, and, like, I spent, I don't know, (laughs) I did put my hand in my pocket and paid for Susan to be my coach and then paid for therapy and then paid for 
um, ketamine treatment and all the psychiatrists. And I was doing my taxes a month or so ago. It was really expensive. Um, (laughs) But it does allow for this growth that was not possible. And even like, like I was thinking about it not that long ago, and it was roughly a year ago, it was like June 8th, I walked into my psychiatrist's office for the first time, and it was a 51 out of 63 on the Beck's depressive scale. And I had already been doing therapy basically twice a week for nine months, and like I had tried 20 different medications. <laughs> like the list goes on. And it's that the transformation that I know Eve Lauren has been and seen it has been incredible. And the things I do today and Laura and I work with the groups together, it's I could not have done this mm. even, you know, a year ago. It was not possible for me. Two different guys in the same chair, hundred <laughs> percent. And that's the that's the power of the journey. And it, it is not easy. And it for me it was a lot very painful. For Gary, it was really painful. You know, it can be less painful. And the other side of it too for folks out there is 1.0 leaders are not only the people who run around and jump up and down and yell at people, right? Like it can be people who just pretend that they don't want to micromanage and really just do nothing. (laughs) (laughs) Like I had a leader tell, or one of my leaders told me this morning about her manager. And she was saying like, I asked him, I said like, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. I have so much work I need to do. I don't have time to do it all. And I asked him for priorities and he just said, figure it out. And it's like, well, that is ghost management. And (laughs) that is also like a style of the, actually in the literature, they call it passive destructive leadership where mm-hmm. you're not clear. You don't set, set expectations. You sort of defer and you avoid confrontation. Mm-hmm. And so there is like the active destructive, which is like egocentric, you know, take accountability for, or take credit for other people's work, shift blame on others, like all the political stuff. But there's also like, a lot of folks are not intentionally trying to be poor leaders, but it's that they just don't have enough awareness to understand that they're not leading in the best way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lauren, they don't do have think? the awareness to understand the impact of the things that they're doing. Right. Mm. And like, I, it's interesting, Lauren, is I, I think a lot of them probably deep down, if they pause just for a minute, would probably realise like those managers at the fast food place that they, they probably deep down go, "This isn't. There's something wrong about this," but they feel compelled because they sort of feel there's no there, there's no other way to do it. Um, but they're not, and that sort of over time though, that can disconnect you to actually seeing and understanding that impact that 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 poor leadership can have, you know, it is seriously meddling with people's lives. And, you know, it's funny how, you know, it's not funny actually when I've, when I've shared with folks, other parents about my, my three adults children's experiences, you know, some, some folk have said things like, well, they should, you know, they're just going to have to learn to harden up, you know, that's and the worst, that's the worst reply ever. <laughs> it, it, isn't it? Because, and, you know, my, my reply when I say to them, you know, I, I, you know, I understand what you're saying. You know, it's a, it, it, you know, it's a tough world out there. But does it really have to be? And it's bits like this that are contributing to that. And it doesn't, you know, they're they're good kids. They're definitely not stupid, and they, you know, definitely got a work ethic. So why do they need to be yelled at and called names? Like maybe clarity is missing about what's supposed to get done. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe, maybe that's the sign. If, you, if you're not happy with what you're seeing in front of you, maybe you haven't been clear in explaining it. Maybe the system hasn't been clear. Um, you know, my, my eldest son actually got a written warning because his till was down at the end of his shift. This is three weeks into his job. Right? It's a fast food outlet. And it turned out that the, the till was supposedly $40 down. 
So I, first thing I said to him when he showed me the written warning, because he didn't even understand what a written warning was. Right? He just <laughs> he just was he was People just write sad. stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this is this, well, he's he's now twenty two, so this is seven years ago. Um, and you know, I've picked him up, and I could tell he was down. And I'm so, well, what's going on? He says, "Oh, they gave me this," and you know, because I, I do what I do, it straight away. I knew it was it's a written warning, and you know, it's, it's pretty serious, right? There's not much more serious than a, than a written warning. I said, "What's this for?" And he goes, "My till was down." I said, "When did this happen?" So this is on a Monday night when I picked him up, and this apparently happened on the Saturday shift. I said, "Did anyone else use your till?" He said, "Yes." I said, "How many other people?" He goes, "At least four." I said, did your shift manager use your till? And he said, yes. Um, I said, did they get written warnings? He goes, no, the shift manager was the one who gave me the written warning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, we're doing a U-turn. <laughs> now, to be fair, the shift manager was 19. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so when I spoke spoke with her, um, you know, was calm and all that sort of stuff and just said, you know, did anyone else use a till? And she said, No. I said, okay. He said, in fact, other staff did, and I, and he said, you did. And she said, oh, well, I did. Yes, I did. And I said, well, ha- how can you give him a written warning if you used the till? And she said, but I'm the shift manager. <laughs> <laughs> As if I wouldn't make that mistake. I'm infallible. <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, okay. And, um, you know, and, and anyway, I coached my son in actually approaching one of the owners of the business about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I was one of those moments where he, it was for him to step up or not. It was purely up to him to decide to, to do that or not. Uh, and he did. And, and, and the person, you know, what they told him was, and this is, this is really interesting for folks out there, right? Because this is how rules, policies and procedures can actually contribute to poor leadership, is that as a franchisee, they have to sign up to a rule from the corporate entity that there is one person per tilt, per shift. But in practice, it can't work like that when heaps of customers come to the counter mm-hmm. and it's all hands on deck, serve, 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 right? And they didn't have technology at the time to be able to say who was, but because that was nominally his till, once it gets counted at the end of the shift, if it doesn't add up, it's his fault. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then you get a written warning, whether it was his fault or not. Now that's meddling with people's lives. <laughs> Even at a 15-year-old, you know, and no one's asking the question. And the owner of the business um, actually said, well, you know, we know it doesn't work, but that's the policy, so we have to implement it. Otherwise, we can't be a franchise. It's like, really? (laughs) So the consequence in that case, even from that, as it turned out from the business owner's point of view, was that's just the cost of business for me, that this kid is going to go home sad and tell his dad three weeks after starting, I'm just a number and this is how I know this is so this is where it all this this is where this stuff starts and you know i guess for your audience it's like i I hope i hope for folks are going you know what this is why our leadership and this is why genuinely caring this is why getting rules that in practice look great in theory but actually don't work we need to get rid of them get rid of them have the courage say we're not doing that Mm -hmm. it's it's totally true right and it's it's the psychological safety and the feedback and actually doing something about it that matters. Like Mm. take that example. And then when I worked in mining, a guy broke his leg and they literally had him come in the next day. So then they wouldn't take an LTI. Like he would sit at a desk, but it was so they could hit a million man hours without an L lost time incident for folks out there. And it's so then everybody at the site would get a bonus and everyone would. And so like, yes, in theory, it's a good idea. Like we want people to be safe, right? And we also want to measure that. So then we know if it's getting worse or better. Mm-hmm. But then as soon as you introduce these other consequences, that's when you're getting behavior. And I've also seen it where people are just making the number green. <laughs> Because, <laughs> right? Because if it's red, then they get punished. And so you're not even seeing reality anymore. Mm-hmm. And so like, these are all the things where it's like, it's not the person on the ground floor is just doing what they can to survive. And it's the systems and the processes that are 
the part that's really not working. Mm. Um, one of my heroes is Russell Ackoff. I don't know if you've ever heard of Ruckle, Russell. He was the professor emeritus at the Wharton Business School. Uh, he passed away a few years ago at the age of about 95, I think he was, and wonderful life, systems thinker. So think of systems thinking. Uh, and one of his quotes was that I absolutely love is, it's better to do the right thing wrong than the wrong thing right. <laughs> because if you do the wrong thing right, you just get wronger and wronger. <laughs> and so I love that quote because he's this professor and he's making up a word like wronger. <laughs> like it's just a made up word. But the gist is right. If you've got this LTI rule and we want to stay green, so we're going to make someone with a broken leg turn up and work behind a desk instead of actually recover because that's going to get us green. That's an example of doing the wrong thing right, which actually just makes you wronger and wronger. And, you know, the, we, leaders have to see this for what it is. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, folks often say, you know, but it takes, you know, we've, got, we've got to wait for the ones at the top to change. We've got to wait for them to, in quotes, get it. Do you really need someone else to get it before you can show you care? I think that's, that's like an interesting coming off point though, right? Because it's incredibly difficult if it is possible at all to bring in elements of authenticity and psych safety when you yourself are trying to fill a hole that exists, right? So that level of healing has to happen before you can even contemplate going in that direction. Yeah. So even for those people and for people that are listening to this now, if you're listening to these examples and you're saying, what the heck, like that doesn't make any sense at all. This is ridiculous. Someone get fired. It's it's not as simple as that, right? We all have areas of who we are that are, you know, fractured or mm -hmm. that are in need of healing. Let's put it that way. And mm -hmm. that's why the journey of getting to that 4.0 or 2.0 leader is painful at times because healing is never an easy process. But if these people are trying to fill a hole that exists, rarely ever will they choose to do, you know, the right thing wrong or the wrong thing right, right? It's really hard to figure out which one should be done because you don't have the ability to exercise the self-awareness to get beyond just the numbers because mm. the numbers are the most important thing to you. Mm. You know, it's, it's interesting you should say that because uh, in, in one of the chapters of the book, I, I actually share two stories from folk that I could not name. Um, one, one's in the banking or the finance sector here in Australia and one's in a large council, city council uh, that we call mm -hmm. a local, local government. Um, and, and both of them through their own journey and going through their, their own pain actually realise there is a better way to lead, even though the overarching culture is not there. And and the, the fact is the people that they're leading, I mean, they're you know, for one of numbers' sake, their own engagement scores are through the roof in comparison to the rest of the organisation. And they are consciously protecting their team from the culture that they themselves have to experience. They're in the hole, mm -hmm. right? They're in the hole, but at least they know they're there and they're, they're trying to set the example with their team. But the, the great thing about those two examples is that they're showing that, you know, for, for both of them, there's a bigger purpose for why they're in that industry that matters to them and they're clear about that. And so they're prepared to tolerate the poor culture that might be around them, but they're not, they're doing the best they can to create a constructive, positive culture with the way that they're leading. So they are choosing to be present when they speak with someone. If someone says, hey, what are my priorities? They'll sit with them and help work out what they, what they actually are for this moment for what that role is, um, even though they might not be getting that clarity themselves from the people in, ver in inverted commas above them in the hierarchy, right? Um, and and you, you're, you're absolutely right, Lauren. It's so, it's, it's, it's not easy um, at all to do that. But I guess I, I, I've got those couple of examples in the book just to show that, yes, it's hard, but it is possible. And you can stay authentic to yourself that way. And you don't have to necessarily leave, 
But obviously, if there's an opportunity over time, and I guess this is the point that over time, we've just got to keep cultivating, keep finding the Barry Waymiller organisations um, as examples. And, and, you know, Bob Chapman's doing an extraordinary job, you know, sh- telling that story and sharing the story and showing possible, it's showing people out there that it's possible. And some of them are now trying to copy. They're trying to do it their way, but they're trying to learn. And, and as more and more companies start to get like that, there will actually be more and more options for people to go, you know what? I can actually be authentic and lead this way in a company or an organization where I'm getting led like that too. <laughs> <laughs> and and it is possible. We work with some folks where it's possible. And it's but it's not easy, right? And and none of the none of this is easy. Mm. But it requires the choice. Mm. And you can choose to go down the journey regardless of everything around you and you can make that choice and hopefully you can make that choice before you go through extreme amounts of pain like Gary and I have Um, (laughs) because ultimately if you don't you likely will hit that pain at some point now it may not change you right we we also work with folks that are not on the path and they're not willing to see the path or go down the path. And that is also something that you need to understand is as you grow, you're going to outgrow people. Mm. And you may outgrow roles and you may outgrow your friends or your husband or wife, whatever it is. And you can only do so much. They have to want to walk the path. In you know, I guess, you know, it was some some of that way is as much as I can with the with my, with my clients is you know we just say look, let's not make any of this compulsory. Let's let people opt in. You know, it's so much more powerful when people opt in, and they say yeah, but we can't afford if so and so doesn't get it. We can't we can't afford that. We go well, you know, let's think let's take a long term view here. What if what if we create a culture? And what if we make it so that people have to apply to come into this? And what if over time there's actually a bit like an Apple store where a new iPhone comes out, there's a queue of people lining up to get into the programs to learn? We can actually, we can do that. We can, we can, you know, just be patient and start with the folk that that, that want to learn and want to, want to, in inverted commas, get it um, and start the journey with them and, and, help them to learn the importance of them sharing their own stories of their own journeys of their own transformations and the impact that it's making for them and and often that impacts actually at home that that's that's the power of the story it's, it's now it might be in an athletic an athlete in an athletic program that's um you know able to perform better because they've freed themselves up if you like because of what they've been learning Lauren, no doubt you've got some commentary on that. Oh, God, absolutely. And, you know, when we were talking before we got onto this uh, call, when we were talking about, you know, seeing people as human beings as opposed to human resources, my mind immediately went to the NCAA. And I know in Australia that's not prominent at all, but I was a part of the NCAA for four years. And Mm. even the year leading up to actually being a student athlete, I got to experience a lot of what it felt like to be a human resource and to be somebody who is either losing a school money or bringing money into a school and having conversations around you while, you know, you're playing a game. It's a game (laughs) that I used to love at one point. Right. And, and watching that kind of get sucked away because you're being treated like a human resource and hey, you're getting all of these things because this is what you're doing for the school. You get treated well because you're you're an athlete here. And you're trying to figure all that out while you're you're judging the rest of how you want to live your life and trying to figure out all of that while also being in an incredibly complex human development stage. Mm. And you're like, I remember asking myself the question many times of what is my value here? Someone is telling me that my value is almost solely coming from athletics, but my career is almost surely going to be over once I'm done here. Mm. So 
<laughs> mm-hmm. So how do I bring together this idea that I'm really important as an athlete for four years and then that's gone and I need a career that people are telling me not to focus on at all while I'm playing my sport? Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's really setting me up for life. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Honestly, and, though, it, it, in ways it did. I'll put it that way. <laughs> sure. And and no, no doubt, though, because you went through some pain trying to figure that stuff out for yourself, you know. How, yeah. how, how, how does the whole me matter, you know? Mm. Okay, there's this athletic bit that matters because you're telling me that does, but what about the rest of me, you know? Right. And I guess that's one of the key messages that we try to get out here is that, you know, as an effective leader, we've, we've got to help people understand that you matter, all of you. Even the flawed yeah. bits. Because <laughs> yeah. we've all got them. No, I've got flawed bits too. Mm-hmm. I, I could line up my wife, Michelle, and five children. They'll happily tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyways, yeah, we, we got to wrap up here. And it's true, right? And it, we all have flawed bits. And actually, that's the part of vulnerability that gives connection. Mm. And that's another leadership lesson as we as we wrap up here. Now, Gary, obviously, they should go to wherever their bookstore is or Amazon and buy your book, Disruption Leadership Matters, or they can head on over to organization or orgs dot orgs that matter dot com for well, your books listed there too, but everything else that you do. Is there anything else you want folks to to follow you or anything else you're working on? Yeah, look up, look me up on LinkedIn. I'm happily uh, accept uh, connections uh, requests on LinkedIn. So you don't have to follow. Send a connection request. I'll accept it, especially if you mention that you're lis- uh, listening as part of this podcast. And my book's actually, since we last chatted, it's now available on Audible and another 50-odd audio book platforms as well. And I want to reach out, actually, and, and uh, thank Auntie Manya Andrews, who's an uh, Indigenous elder here in Australia, because if it wasn't for Auntie's intervention uh, with some knowledge for me um, I my book wouldn't be on audible um, I got stuck I couldn't I couldn't navigate some of the taxation <laughs> systems get onto audible and and auntie and I were having a side chat in LinkedIn we actually haven't met in person yet um, and you know I'm on my own uh, journey of discovery uh, about our indigenous culture here and discovering how much I don't know which is just blowing my mind in a really positive way. And um, Auntie mentioned that she was writing a book, and I firmly placed my foot in my mouth when I said to her, "Hi, hey, hey, oh, I've been really fortunate. I've self-published. I've got this Amazon Kindle number one. You know, I'm happy to share any lessons with you." And she writes back and says, "Gary, it's my fourth book." <laughs> <laughs> so I looked her up, and all her three books already were on Audible. So I write, I said, "Auntie, I, I see that you're on Audible." I've been stuck with how to get published through the taxation system and even our government agency can't help me and I'm stuck and I don't normally give things up, but I'm thinking I'm going to let this go. And she's, I said, you probably know, you must know the answer. And she's, and she wrote back 20 seconds later and she said, yes, Simone Filer from the audio, uh, the Brisbane audio book production company, she'll sort you out within six weeks of that message. My book was published on Audible. So thanks, Auntie Manya Andrews. I love that. Yeah. And for, I know everyone listening loves audio books because they're all in the gym at the treadmill or something right now. So head on over to Audible, get a copy of Disruption Leadership Matters and listen to it while you're running. Lauren, uh, is there anything you want to plug while you're on? Anything that I want to plug? Well, I would first like to just say thanks for having me on. It's it's great to be back in uh, this locker room that, I mean, I listen to each episode every week, so it's great, great to be here. Um, I think if there's something that I can plug, it's just going to be the awareness piece, right? And, and turning on that light of self-awareness, if that's what you want to call it, can be really, really intimidating. I want to make that super clear, right? This is not an easy journey and we are openly talking about that. But I think the best piece of it is, is the first step is often the hardest. Mm. And once you can get over that first step, then the rest of it just starts to click. The more you start to figure out about yourself and the way that you operate. Somebody recently used um, the term operating system. The more you learn about your own operating system, 
the more at home you feel with yourself, the better you feel about the way that you show up in different situations. So get through that first step. Don't be afraid to turn on that light of self-awareness because once you do it, you're never going back. I didn't. Mm. Rob mm. didn't. Gary didn't. <laughs> if you have the operating system, I just have the blue screen that says error. <laughs> <laughs> no, and with uh, the dial-up sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For everyone out there, yeah. If you haven't yet, please hit subscribe to Leadership Launchpad Project on your favorite podcast platform. And if you're looking for any leadership development, mindset coaching, Lauren also does high performance athletic athletic coaching and other psych safety DEI stuff. Head on over to elitehighperformance.com to find us there. And for me, I just want to leave everyone with another quote. So I have one from Roy T. Bennett. And he says, learn to light a candle in the darkest moments of someone's life. Be the light that helps others see. It is what gives life its deepest significance. Gary, thanks so much for joining us again. It was it was an absolute pleasure, and I'm looking forward to number three. Sounds great. It might be here in Australia when you're visiting soon, so that would be wonderful. Thank you for having me, Rob and Lauren. Thank you. Everyone listening, thank you so much, and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>